Very good evening to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful to have you all join us. We left off in 2 Kings 14 last time. You'll have to excuse me in this study. I've got a little bit of, I think it's sinuses or a cold or something. It's not the coronavirus, so <laughs> I've already had that. I had that before the pandemic hit. <laughs> it's no joke. It's pretty terrible. Anyway, um, but just excuse me today. I seem a little bit off. 2 Kings 14 we left off in talking about the rise and fall of Amaziah, king of Judah, and Joash, the king of Israel. We're now going to see the kingdom of Israel in tonight's study. It's going to actually reach all the way down to King um, Hosea, or Hosea, whichever you wish to say, and he is the final king that actually reigns and the northern kingdom of Israel. We will see that tonight. In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Russell Dilday summarizes pretty well the situation that this new king has come into. Following the tragic events that brought King Amaziah's reign to an end, Jerusalem was in disarray. A major section of its protective wall was destroyed, its temple and palace emptied of their treasures, and some of its inhabitants taken away to Israel as hostages. Sixteen years old was uh, Uzziah when he, he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem, fifty-two years. And his mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And Uzziah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. But remember Amaziah, he, at the very end, he started to really go off the rails. And Uzziah, we see something happen to him in a very uh, similar fashion. Save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still on the high places. We've already discussed these high places. These are the old ancient altars that the people at the time of Judges, 500 years before, had built. And he, like all the others before him, had not removed these ancient altars. And the Lord smote the king, Uzziah, so that he was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a several house, and Jotham the king's son was over the house, judging the people of the land. Well, what happened? The Lord smote the king? I mean, why? in the book of Kings, we're not told hardly any details about, in comparison to what the book of Chronicles tells us about the reign of Uzziah. It's quite a fascinating reign. Second Chronicles 26 tells us, And Uzziah sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper, and man, did he ever. Uzziah prospers very much like King David before him. He is, gets this mighty army with a thousand mighty men of valor, and as he builds fortifications. Let's just keep reading. And God helped him against the Philistines, remember David fought the Philistines, and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gerbal and the Mehunims. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, and at the valley gate, and at the turning of the wall, and fortified them. So he's really building up these walls. Remember how King Joash of Israel had broken down a huge breach in the wall of Jerusalem in order to go in and plunder during the reign of Amaziah, Uzziah's father. Well, now Uzziah is not only rebuilding that that back, that breach, but he's also fortifying it. He's And he does much more. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Messiah the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. So God had really blessed Uzziah, and he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Notice that. 
But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up and pride to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. That's the priest's job. The kings are not allowed to do that. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord, eighty priests that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests of the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. I believe that what had happened was Uzziah, he, like so many Christians, they start to think that they're so close to God that they start taking liberties that other Christians fear to take and God I don't think likes that at all then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense and while he was wroth with the priest the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar and Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. So not only are they telling him to get out, now he can't wait to get out of the house of the Lord, because this leprosy has just struck his forehead. <laughs> and he has this affliction till the day of his death. He has to go in several houses, many in different rooms, in order to stay away from the population. He no longer was this glory and mighty king and the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did Uzziah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah so Uzziah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David and Jotham his son reigned in his stead in the thirty and eighth year of Uzziah king of Judah did Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reign over Israel in Samaria six months and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. So we just got done talking about the reign of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And now we are discussing the reign of Zechariah in Israel. Now this would have been the fourth descendant from Jehu. Jehu was only promised from the Lord because he destroyed uh, he did the will of the Lord in the beginning. and uh, But he's only promised four descendants upon the throne. So this is the very last descendant of Jehu. And he only reigned six months. And Shalom, the son of Jebesh, conspired against Zechariah and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. Now who was this Shalom that killed Zechariah? John Gill says he was a friend of his, as Josephus calls him, encouraged by the dissatisfaction of the people to him. Amos the prophet actually prophesied about this in Amos 7, so he is very much alive and well. But during the days of the father of Zechariah, whom was Jeroboam the second, during his days Amos actually prophesied about this. He writes in Amos 7, And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will arise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. This is the Lord speaking. So after that prophecy is given by Amos, the people of the northern kingdom, they get angry about this. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, whom was the king, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee. In the midst of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. See, Amos actually stood up where this golden, ca uh, golden calf was at Bethel and prophesied this before all of these uh, pagan worshippers. Very courageous prophets, these men. For thus Amoth saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah, the priest, the false priest, said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. <laughs> go away, go down to Judah and do that stuff. We don't want to hear that up here. 
So after a little bit of back and forth, Amos finally says to this priest in whom tells him, go down to Judah and leave us alone. Am Amos actually says this, therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be a harlot in the city and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword and thy land shall be divided by line and thou shalt die in a polluted land and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. So the whole nation is starting to hear you you all are about to not even be a people anymore. You're about to be taken into captivity, scattered, made slaves. And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. This was the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the ninth and thirtieth year of Uzziah, uh, king of Judah, and he reigned a full month in Samaria. Man, a full month. He just got done killing a king whom only lasted six months. Now he only lasts a month. Now he's being assassinated. For Menahem, the son of Gadai, went up from Terza and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. Jamison Fawcett Brown said, He was opposed and slain, talking about Shalom, he was opposed and slain by Menahem, who, according to Josephus, was commander of the forces, which on the report of the king's murder, speaking of how he murdered, Shalom murdered Zechariah, so once that Menahem hears about that, on the report of the king's murder, were besieging Terza, a town 12 miles east of Samaria, and formerly a seat of the kings of Israel, raising the siege, he marched directly against the usurper, slew him, and reigned in his stead. Right here is a quick visual for you all. It's not far at all from Samaria, Terza, which used to be the capital right before Samaria. And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made behold they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of israel then menahem smote tifsah and all that were therein and the coast thereof from terza because they opened not to him therefore he smote it and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up tifsah is located I think Ellicott sums it up best what's happening. The course of events was apparently this. After slaying Shalom, Menahem returned to Terza and set out thence at the head of his entire army to bring the rest of the country to acknowledge him as king, meaning that he was traveling all the way up north, declaring himself as the king so that no one would rise up, even to Tifsa. Tifsa resisting his claims he made an example of it which proved efficient to terrorize other towns into submission in the nine and thirtieth year of Ezariah, king of judah began menahem the son of gadai to reign over israel and reign ten years in samaria so we're just told right there that uh, menahem reigns ten years and he did that which was evil in the sight of the lord he departed not all his days from the sins of jeroboam the son of nebat who made israel to sin once again he didn't remove the two calves one at dan one at bethel he never did remove those and so they remained in idolatry and pool the king of assyria now pay close attention to this we're, we're going to start hearing about assyria now and Pul, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. This is the very first time that we actually hear about the kingdom of Assyria since the book of Genesis, hundreds of years before. Probably a very small uh, little tribe of people, small little location, but it actually winds up growing and taking over everything. But we're told about how Menahem gives Pool a thousand talents of silver, which today's money, that would be about $16 million, in order to become his ally, in order to solidify his reign. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even all the mighty men of wealth of each man, 50 shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. These, it's actually said and spoken of in the comments that he this would have required at that amount of each man 50 shekels of silver. It would have took 60,000 
of these wealthy men to give 50 shekels of silver apiece, 60,000. And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the fiftieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and reigned two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. But Pekah, the son of Rem Remalia, a captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house with Argob and Arae, and with him fifty men of the Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his stead. We see these assassinations like crazy happening in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, we don't read much about stuff like that. But the irony is not lost. John Gill comments on it. Pika killed Pekahiah and reigned in his room as his father killed Shalom and reigned in his stead. Matthew Henry said, This history shows Israel in confusion. Though Judah was not without troubles, yet that kingdom was happy compared with the state of Israel. The imperfections of true believers are very different from the allowed wickedness of ungodly men. The imperfections of true believers, yeah, we as Christians, we may have our troubles, but as long as we're not in the entirely wicked state, well, at least we have some kind of peace. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. I heard it said once in our modern ver vernacular by a preacher, I believe it was Adrian Rogers, he said, the rich man eats good. But the poor man sleeps good. I'd much rather have a good night's sleep than a big steak on the plate. Better as little with a good good night's sleep and peace. And the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In the two and fiftieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah, Pekah the son of Ramaliah began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned twenty years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. These calves remained, all the, all the kings of Israel. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon, and Elbel, beth Meacham and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. Now we're seeing this rise of, cap of captivities now. And these are all the lands that were taken. This Assyrian king comes down and he starts to take all this land from uh, the king of Israel, Pekah. Once again, John Gill said, he carried them Captive to Assyria, which was the first captivity of Israel in which half their tribes were carried away. Half, five out of the ten, carried away. And Hosea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the twentieth year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Hosea is the very, or Hosea, is the very last king of the northern kingdom of Israel until the captivity of the Assyrian. But Joseph Benson gives good comment on why Hosea conspired against Pekah. It is probable that the people were provoked at him for leaving them exposed to a foreign enemy while he invaded Judah. Speaking of Pekah. While he invaded Judah and that Hosea took advantage of their discontent and disgust to seize and slay him. Thus Pekah's treason and violence returned upon himself at last. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he, twenty-five years old, when he began to reign, speaking of Jotham. And he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. 
And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, he did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord, though. It makes mention of that. And they believe that this higher gate was probably the upper gate. We're not 100% sure on where that would have been. Albert Barnes kind of gives a little bit more detail on it. Jotham followed the example of his father in military, no less than in religious matters. The higher or upper gate of the temple is thought to have been that toward the north, and its fortification would seem to indicate fear of an attack from that quarter. Remember how his father Uzziah built the walls of Jerusalem very high, made fortifications, strengthened the city very much. So is Jotham, his son, now doing that. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send against Judah Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. Now, it's the very same Pekah that we just got done speaking on. So both the Syrians are coming down and Israel to fight at Jerusalem. But remember, Uzziah had built these these very, very tough walls and even made like machines in there that launch these javelins and arrows out of them, which the Romans would later very much perfect. But really, by what, by what it's saying to set the scene for you all in the proper timeline, it says, in those days, meaning towards the very end of Jotham's reign, because Jotham actually, he dies in peace, but his son Ahaz is the one in whom has to deal with these two nations coming down and fighting against him. Isaiah the prophet actually comes up to Ahaz in those days. This is Jotham's son, Ahaz. And Ahaz is nervous about these two kingdoms coming down to fight him. And um, Isaiah tells him, the Lord speaks through Isaiah and says, Don't worry, you're not going to perish. Because what they were wanting to do, these two nations, they were wanting to come down and set up their own king on the throne of Judah, which Ahaz was occupying at this time, they were wanting to come down, kill him, and remove, and that would have really of, that may have even, like Athaliah, that may have thrown a kink in the lineage of Christ coming to earth. God says, no, that's not going to happen, don't worry, through Isaiah. But Isaiah goes on after that, and he says, moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. He's, he's, he says, of this reassurance that you'll not die, Ahaz. He says, ask a sign of the Lord. He says, the Lord desires to give you a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And Isaiah said, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? He means, don't worry about asking God. He's got infinite energy. He, he doesn't mind to answer your questions or your, you know, show you a sign. It's a light thing to God. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Isaiah says. He says, okay, you don't want to ask. He's still going to tell you what's going to happen. Now, some of you may know about this great prophecy about to be given right here. It's one of the most famous. Behold. Here's your sign, Ahaz. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the prophecy of the Virgin Mary and Jesus coming to earth because Emmanuel, it means God with us. And Jesus, whenever he came to us on this earth, then he was God with us in the flesh. Now, what he's meaning by that is he says, that is the guarantee that you'll not die because that son that is going to come through your lineage, he says, he is God himself on the earth. It's a guarantee. No, no one can interrupt that. Your seed will be safe. Don't worry. You and your seed. 
And Jotham slept with his fathers, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. And Ahaz his son reigned in his stead, as we just got done talking about Ahaz. Well, that is the chapter for today. I'm not going to hold y'all up any longer. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to be getting into the actual great captivity of the remainder of the kingdom of Israel. God, peace be with you all. Amen.